my number one pick for this year was uh, another Ryan Gosling film, uh, and it was The Ides of March. She's threatening to release the story. How did she find out? Don't play dumb, Tom. You think I leaked it to her? Yeah, who else? Yeah, I didn't link it to her, Steve. Well, I know I didn't, so that leaves you. Okay, well, what does she know? She knows whatever you told her. Did you tell anyone? No, did you? No. Did you admit to meeting with me? No. All right. Then we stonewall her and she's got nothing. She's going to take the story to Drudge or to Roll Call. She's trying to blackmail me. She wants info about Thompson. Well, then tell her what she wants to know. I absolutely loved that film. Um, there was, oh God, there was so much I loved about it. Uh, it had great acting. It had a great story. It had, you know, uh, it had a great cinematography in it. Um, it had so many twists and turns, things I didn't see coming. Um, there are people I know who said, oh, I kind of saw that coming and I'm not going to give anything away for people who haven't seen it. But honestly, it took me by surprise. I was so involved in it, and I remember I went to go see it with my girlfriend. She didn't know what she was really going to see, and I kind of did. And it was it was just so good, and we walked out of the theater, and she loved it too. And, you know, the scene where there's this one scene. I'm not going to tell you what happens because I don't want to ruin it. But there's this scene where Ryan Gosling finds out something very morbid. And he runs to his car, and he gets in the car... And it's just, it was incredible cinematography. He gets in the car, and it's raining. And you can tell he's hurt. And the lighting makes it look like the the rain falling on the windshield is coming down his face, almost like tears. That's what I took away. Whether it was intentional or not, that's what I took away. And I loved it. I thought it was so well thought out. I thought George Clooney directed it. And, uh, and I think he worked on the script. And... He co-wrote it, yes. He co-wrote it. Uh, he didn't take a paycheck for it either, which I thought was incredible. And That just proves how much of a swell guy yeah, George Clooney really is. Yeah, he, that was, I thought that was very admirable of him not to... He did not take a check for it. He thought it was uh, a, a piece of film art, and he worked on it because he wanted to do it for himself. And I loved it. I thought that was great. The story arc of the characters is so good, you know. The change in Ryan Gosling... Uh, from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie is, is so interesting to watch. Um, you know, because I feel like, I feel like that it, the, the ideas that run through him, you know, the ideas of revenge or the ideas of ambition, those are all things everyone's felt before. And, uh, you know, it's all things we hear about in politics and it was, it was a good, good way of showing it. Also something I really liked about it is the political, neutrality of it uh it wasn't it wasn't left hardcore left wing or hardcore right wing and i think they did that because they didn't want to you know you know piss anyone off and in fact it's the the whole movie is the democratic primaries and even if you're a republican you're not going to hate the movie because it really isn't about the political ideas it's about the working of politics what happens and what can go wrong and how people can work the system and it's it's just so good. Um, great foreshadowing. Great foreshadowing. Uh, there's this scene uh, where Ryan Gosling, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and Marissa Tomei are in a bar. And I noticed this uh, because George Clooney intentionally put the camera on, uh, like, there's, like, a jazz singer in the bar, and he's singing, you know, I'll see you again one sunny day, or whatever that song is. And, you know, he kept the camera on this guy for, like, like five or ten seconds. And, you know, it has great foreshadowing for the end of the movie. Uh, and I don't want to give away the ending. But it is really good. Um, so, yeah, that's my number one pick. Uh, you should all see it if you haven't seen it. Um, I really enjoyed it. I uh, That's a great pick, Ryan. Great pick. And I, that'll also be an honorable mention for me because I really enjoyed The Eyes of March. Um, but I will agree with you. This is the year of Ryan Gosling. And uh, my number one pick is Drive. Mm -hmm. And Drive is just... 
first of all, I'm a fan of Nicholas Winding Refn, the director. I think he's one of those directors who is going to make a real stamp for himself in our country. This is his first real like American film. He directed uh, in 2008 Bronson uh, that starred Tom Hardy, which basically has launched his career to what he is now. He's going to be playing Bane uh, in the next Batman film. Which I am just so excited for. We all are. But, um, you know, what Refn, he has this way of showing violence in... Uh, in his movies that are more like they're more like a dance sort of like a ballet there's like some sort of beauty to his violence it's kind of, I mean it sounds kind of weird saying that but if you look at his movies the push trilogy and uh, Bronson uh, you, you'll see it and also uh, Valhalla Rising which I think is an underrated movie that no one uh, no, I don't think anyone's really heard of and uh, they should check it out it's on instant Netflix and um, But Drive is definitely one of those movies that is going to have a cult classic stamp. People will be talking about it for years on end. It's going to be one of Ryan Gosling's most uh, memorable performances, and probably the most recognized of all his performances, in my opinion. People will just, like, rem when they say Ryan Gosling, ah, oh, Driver. That's what I think. I, he's created an iconic character. The Jack... The jacket um, with the scorpion on it, and you know he says to Albert Brooks's character, which Ryan, you mentioned uh, Drive, but I don't think you touched on Albert Brooks, and this was a great role for Albert Brooks. I haven't seen him in a movie in a long time, and he's always the funny man, the sweet guy, the you know the neurotic or the fish, <laughs> or the fish, or the fish. <laughs> but um, but uh, this movie, this really was something different for him. He was. Carry in this film. Yeah. He was a bad, bad mofo. He got ugly and he got mean. I mean, there was a part in, in the pizzeria where he stabs a guy with a fork in the eye and just starts jabbing his throat with a knife. And then he says, now you can clean my mess up. I mean, he was a badass. And he's getting recognized for his uh, performance. He's winning a lot of awards for his, uh, the supporting role. And I'm sure he's going to be a shoe in for um, Best Supporting Actor come Oscar Day. Uh, I mean, this this role is getting as much talk as when Christoph Waltz was getting all the talk for *Inglorious Bastards*. You know, he just he keeps winning all these supporting roles over and over and over. He's nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Supporting Actor. He probably will win that one too because this is so different than anything he has ever done, and I like that. I like that Nicholas Winding Refn had you know the chance to work with Albert Brooks, and I love that Albert Brooks was ready to bring out the dark side while still maintaining the humor. He was still funny. Yeah, there was some funny stuff I, with him. I was in the theater. Uh, I saw it with a friend of mine, and every scene he was in, it was hard for me not to think of Finding Nemo, but he was so dark, he, he was so different, and it was, it was interesting, you're right, I didn't mention how good he was, uh, it was really good. I think the best scene, though, in the entire movie is the last five minutes, where he and Driver meet at a Chinese restaurant, and it's just, you know, there's not much dialogue going on, it's just them looking at each other, and, you know, he wants to know where the money is, and... Then it cut. It start. It's intercutting between what's going to happen after that uh, lunch meeting and what's going on right now. So you're seeing two different times paralleling between one another, and it's just it's so eerie and so like you know unnerving, sitting there wondering what's happening, and you're seeing it happen, and then it goes back to wondering what is going to happen. So it's it's it's, it's mixed. It's like playing with your emotions. Yeah, it was good editing. The soundtrack you mentioned, Ryan. The soundtrack is unbelievable there's these five great songs that um emulate the the 80s and then the score is very you know subtle techno in a way uh, done by cliff martinez and uh, i said the same thing about his score for contagion which was you know as just as unnerving as uh drive so i, I like cliff martinez's work and uh, it was the both films they had great scores but drive was definitely a more memorable one and um I have a debate with some people about uh, the sequence in the elevator. Not not the part where um, Driver is uh, kicking that guy's skull in, which, I mean, that was great. It's the part where he kisses Carrie Mulligan. I personally think that didn't happen, which I... And many people are saying, well, it did happen. You're seeing it. They're kissing each other. But in a way, you see the lights starting to dim, and you hear this beautiful, like, operatic music going on. And for all you know, this could be like a dream sequence where that... His character, this is what he's always wanted to do. He wanted to kiss this beautiful woman. He loves her and cares about her. And it's just, it's, you know, it's kind of, it almost emulates a dream coming true. It's very interesting you bring that up. I never thought about it that way. So, yeah, you really don't know if it's just, if it's in his head and he's, 
it's his his want and his desire to do that. Or if they really do do that, maybe that's the state of mind they both have. And if you look at it carefully, because right when the, the lights start to come back on, he turns around. She's back in the same position where she was before uh, when he you know pushed her aside to kiss her. So, I mean, maybe that's what Nicholas Winning Refn was playing with, and maybe it was a dream sequence. And then, of course, the the violent kicks in where he just starts bashing that guy's skull in. And from what I read um, uh, in American Cinematographer, uh, Siegel was saying that they had to cut out about an extra 30 seconds of that sequence because it got too violent and it was borderline NC-17. So when you saw that head crush like a cantaloupe, there was more to that shot. And I'm hoping we can see that in the DVD extras because I want to see that skull just be crushed into a pulp. I mean, call me disgusting or twisted, but that was just that just made me jump. The scene, the scene of the strip club with the hammer. Oh my god, that's my favorite scene in the whole oh, movie. I mean, I love I love the too. elevator scene, but the the scene in the strip club is an interesting one because everything stops. He walks into the the dressing room and you see all these topless girls and everything. And you know when you see a, a scene like that in a movie, kind of like that. Uh, I guess us guys, our attention is on those naked girls, like, ooh, naked girls, boobies. But no, our attention is, and it's smack dab in the middle of the shot. You see all these girls surrounding Ryan Gosling. Our attention is on Ryan Gosling and what he's about to do. And the character, too. His attention isn't on the women. He doesn't even stop to look at them. He is focused on one thing. And, I mean, he's like a he's like a heat-seeking missile. He was. And that scene is just my favorite. And whenever I mention it's my favorite uh, scene in the movie, everyone's, you know, giving me grief. Like, oh, because I have naked girls. I'm like, well, yeah, it has naked girls. But our focus isn't on that. It's on Ryan Gosling. He is such an intense character in this movie. And when he takes that bullet out... And and shows the guy like you remember this. I mean, I when I saw it the first time at a, at a press screening, uh, right when he takes the hammer all the way up, ready to like you know strike, this woman behind me screamed. She screamed. The entire theater was on the edge of their seat, waiting if he was going to do what we all thought he was going to do. And uh, it, that's just great suspense. Yeah, it was uh, it was a good scene, great scene. Uh, that and the elevator scene are my favorite scenes, and the scene where he's driving with Carrie Mulligan in the sun. You know, because I, I just love the scenes where he's driving. You know, you can tell his character, uh, that is where he's most happiest, is in, you know, in the car driving. You know, he lives to drive. That is his character. Uh, you know, he, you know, you know, throughout the movie, there's this, there's the Brooks is trying to get him to be a driver for him to make money. And he's not interested. He just, he just wants to drive for the pleasure of driving. Yeah. And I just uh, before we end the show, I just wanted a, one quick tidbit. Um, I love Brian Cranston in this movie. He's a good guy. You know, he walked into my shop here about five or six years ago, uh, right out of the blue, asking for a job. So I put him to the test, see what he can do. Kid's amazing. So I hire him on the spot. Boom. At about half the wages I normally pay. He didn't blink an eye. Hey, kid, come over here for a second, will you? And I have been exploiting him ever since. <laughs> Shh, don't tell him. I, yeah. I, I, I love Breaking Bad, but I love to, you know, he, he's got this well-likable character. Yeah, even if he is likable. playing, even if he's playing a bit of a scumbaggy kind of guy, he's still likable, and he was very likable in this movie, too. Oh, yeah, too. He's, he is a likable guy. I could see him, like, in real life being really nice. Yeah, and, you know, he was in a lot of movies this year, and he's got a lot of movies coming out next year, too. And, I mean, he was in Contagion. I thought he was great in that, too. And uh, he's going to be in uh, that World War II fighter pilot film, uh, um, Red Tails. And then yeah, he'll... What do you think of that, by the way? We'll save that for another show, but I'm interested. Uh, My attention's uh, been grabbed by that. Who's, who thought the father of Malcolm in the Middle was such a good actor? Oh, yeah. So and, uh, oh, he'll be in uh, the remake of Total Recall. Oh, cool. So, anyways, um, you can uh, read more of my reviews and articles at thatmoviesweloveswebsite.wordpress.com. You can follow me on Twitter at double a a prod, spelled D O U B L E A A P R O D. Prod is short for productions. Thank you for listening for another episode of Movie Phone Call, and see you at the movies.